Good morning, Grand Point. We're so glad to see you all here this morning. Hey, we have two new faces on stage. Make them feel welcome. We have Corey on electric guitar and Lily on the keys. Um, let's just welcome them here this morning. Would you guys please stand with us as we start off with worshiping our God today? Last week, Pastor Lawrence mentioned that heaven is going to be loud, and I cannot wait for that day. But until then, we have an opportunity right here in this place right now to get a little loud. Are you with me? Can we do that this morning? Let's raise a hallelujah in this place together, church.
Grace and hallelujah. Come on, we can do a little better than that. Amen. Glad to be here today. Hey, go ahead and have a seat. Go ahead and have a seat. Welcome into the house here this morning. Uh, it is a hallelujah kind of day, and I'll be talking a little bit about our Next Steps weekend in a moment. But first of all, it's going to tell you about our turkey, right? I made a big deal about our turkey last week, 34-pound turkey. Uh, all that is to say, long story short, it was amazing. So Brian and Kathy Hewitt, where are you? Thanks for providing a tender turkey. It was beautiful. A lot of leftover sandwiches are out here in the lobby after church today. So, no, good to have you here. Uh, I know that when we talk about Thanksgiving, we often talk about food and family. But even if you didn't have any of that, maybe you were home alone eating PBJ or something like that. There's so much to be grateful for as we consider the God's blessings in our lives, spiritual, physical, and we're glad that you're here now on this first Sunday of Advent as we're going to begin uh, with our Advent series in just a moment. Uh, one thing that I just need to bring to your attention, and I've done this at every service so far, is uh, most of you know that we do not exist just right here in this room as Grand Point Church. We have campuses at Shippensburg and Greencastle, but we also have global partners. And some of our global partners are in urgent need of our prayers this morning. I just got a message uh, yesterday. Uh, I, I'm going to ask that you, I, I can do this here. We're not online, right? So I'm going to ask that uh, you keep this in this room, though. Do not post anything at all because it is serious. But we have some ministries in India. One of our pastors has been accused of forced conversions. Uh, that simply means that in the government on, of, of India, uh, he is subject to arrest or probably imprisonment, and our entire ministry is subject to being seized by the government. Everything that, that we have poured into that for years and years and years. So the message came to Grand Point Church specifically because we sponsor uh, these pastors, and they said, please, please have your people pray today, uh, this weekend. So we're going to do that. We're going to pause right now, and I'm going to just give you a few moments to, to offer your prayers on behalf of India, the pastors and their families there. Pray for protection. God's amazing grace and mercy and justice to be there. This pastor has not done this. It's false allegations, but it's in the hands of the government right now. So we're going to pray this morning, and uh, I'll give you a few moments of silence, then I'll lead us in a prayer. Would you do that? Let's pray for our friends in India right now. God, as we gather here this morning, we have this vivid reminder that not everyone can do what we do. Not everyone can gather and worship freely like we do here in this country and forgive us for taking that for granted. God, we recognize today that there are parts of our world in which Christians need to gather secretly and somewhat uh, in, in private conditions, and there's government that's watching them all the time and village people and all that, and that is the case right now for our friends in, in India. And so, God, we pray right now, we intercede on behalf of, of their ministries there, on behalf of this uh, particular pastor and his family and their congregation, and just ask, Lord, for your incredible grace and mercy to be realized through this very trying time. Lord, sometimes we, we, we counter fear when it comes to things like this, but today we're going to choose to put faith over fear. We're going to trust in you because you can be trusted. And we're going to just live out our faith right now and believe that whatever happens, it's going to be for the best of, of uh, the people there, the furtherance of the gospel, and to your glory. So we pray to that end today for our friends there in India, and we, we lift them up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So this is Next Steps weekend, and uh, we're celebrating a couple next steps that people have taken. Uh, today, we're introducing 35 new members coming into Grand Point. I've done this in all four services. I'm not tired of it yet. I love reading this list. Here they are. If your name is on this list, when I read your name, would you please stand? Today, we're welcoming David and Keisha Akers, Ryan Carmack, Mark and Faye Castor, Lindy Coder, uh, Juan and Carly Grisette, uh, Mark and uh, Matt and Teresa Calmy, Chris and Christian Martin, Thomas and Joan Newcomer, Charles Pensinger, uh, Russ and Angie Pittman, Israel Strom, Dave and Holly Trossel, Eric and Elena Yoder, Stephanie and Aaron Zebart, Erica Grosh, uh, Grosh, Anna Harris, Shannon Hummer, Dan and Tina Mowen, uh, Justin Jennifer and Emma Nunnally, Beth Powers, Tony Yonak, 
Beth Schlatter. A few of you standing here. Come on, give them a Grand Point welcome. Actually, give them a standing ovation. We can do better than this. Standing ovation. Welcome, man. Great to have new members coming in here. Love it, love it, love it. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. As we say here all the time, whenever someone joins our church, we just became a better place, and we truly do believe that. Last night we were here, we had 11 folks being baptized, and uh, it was just an amazing night as uh, we celebrated that regeneration of all these individuals. Let me see if I can find just a few of the testimonies uh, that, that were shared last night. Um, but one of them came, and uh, uh, she says, I was at rock bottom in my life. That was kind of a common theme, by the way, rock bottom. She says, I'm a survivor of almost every type of abuse, uh, mental abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, alcohol abuse, drug abuse. She was through it all. And her life took a 180-degree turn that led her to discover what she says is a purpose larger than what she could have ever imagined. And we celebrated that last night. Christina says, to make a long story short for Christina, she hit rock bottom with her life, checked into an AA program. She's now a member of Regeneration, our recovery ministry here at Grand Point. And last night, she celebrated five months of being clean and sober. And uh, yeah, you can applaud for that as well. Uh, Ryan comes and he says, well, he was a resident at Noah's house, uh, one of our ministry partners that we support, and that's what brought him to Chambersburg. While at Chambersburg, he discovered Grand Point Church, came in here and became part of uh, Regeneration Ministry, and uh, he says it was attending Regen that sealed his decision and given his life to the Lord. He's now clean for one year, 10 months, and uh, again, you can just applaud for these <laughs> folks. Uh, too many other stories to tell right now, but I promise you we're going to share some of those fuller stories later because God is doing some amazing things through you and through, your church, uh, through the church that you're a part of here, and it was great to celebrate that. We've also celebrated uh, child dedications at our services, and we're going to do that again the same uh, here in this service this morning. So in just a few moments, I'm going to invite the parents to bring their children for dedication. But before we do that, let me just tell you a little bit about child dedication because we come from all different traditions and backgrounds and it means different things for different people. So we kind of frame child dedication within the framework of two questions. What is it and what is it not? So let me answer question number two first. Child dedication is not something that is biblically required. Like nowhere in the Bible where you read, parents, you need to dedicate your children to God. But we do have some great examples of child dedication. When Hannah dedicated her son Samuel at the temple, she had this amazing uh, statement. And, and she says in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 27, at the dedication, she says, I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And then after Hannah dedicated Samuel to the Lord, she left him at the Lord's tent to, con to continue serving there for his whole life. We say this every time we do child dedication. Parents, do not leave your kids here. Take them home with you. I mean, they are absolutely adorable, but take them home. What, what Hannah meant by that was she's like, I'm dedicating, I'm, I'm fully surrendering this child to the Lord. Second thing that child dedication is not it's not a ceremony of salvation. In other words, the things that we say and do here today do not make these children spiritual, saved, or destined for heaven. We believe Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for it is by grace through faith that we receive salvation, not of anything that we do, not of our works, so that none of us can boast. All of these beautiful children that we're dedicating today will one day need to make their personal decision, just like all of us do, to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So that's what child dedication is not. So here's what it is. Child dedication, number one, is receiving and recognizing these children as God's incredible blessing. Uh, Psalm 121 or 127 verse three says, children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. So today, we're gonna receive these children and parents as God's people with joy and also with this sobered sense of responsibility that comes with parenting these children. And we're gonna to stand together with them and uh, work with this dedication. The second thing, child dedication, is it's, it's a time for us to model God's love 
So we're, we're coming alongside the parents who are dedicating their children today, and we're saying as a church, listen, we're going to walk with you. We're going to stand beside you. We're going to take this journey of parenting with you. We're going to model God's love to your children, and we're going to do our best uh, for that as well. And then third child, third child dedication is an act of obedience where um, the scripture says, parents, just nurture, raise and nurture your children in the admonition of the Lord. And so we're just uh, kind of taking that as a step of obedience where this is that first step uh, to do that. So this was a command given to, the, uh, given to Israel, uh, but the entirety of God's family. So what I'd like to do right now is introduce the families uh, to come with their children that are being dedicated. And uh, then we're going to uh, have a prayer together, and then I'll have a personal uh, dedication for each of them. So first of all, I'm going to ask, is um, Tatum Sage friend here today? Uh, you registered for last service. Wasn't sure if they came in today. No? Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce Paxton Ray uh, Krushong and Tegan Lynn Krushong, presented by parents Brent and Carly Krushong. Would you give them a welcome uh, to the stage today? Let's go right in the middle. Carolyn Kate Gilbert, presented by her parents, uh, Seth and Caitlin Gilbert. Give Kathleen Kate a welcome to our service this morning. And Barrett Scott Yoder, presented by his parents, Isaiah and Morgan Yoder. I believe this is our youngest one month old. Come on up, give him a welcome today. We so appreciate you parents uh, presenting your children to this and giving us this opportunity to uh, be a part of this service as well. Isn't this beautiful? So here's what we do. We believe that, again, this is a commitment for all of us to make, uh, not just for these parents, but for all of us as a church. So I'm going to ask you today, if you would be willing to commit to support, pray for, model God's love the best way that we can to these parents and these families, would you stand uh, and let us recognize that as well? So parents, I want you to look out there and see the rest of us who are willing to stand with you in this journey. Let me pray for you. God, as we gather here for this ceremony of child dedication, we want to first join with these parents in giving you thanks for the gift of these children. The scriptures remind us that children are a blessing from the Lord, and indeed they are most days. Right? We know that one day uh, there's a responsibility that comes though with raising these children. We know that one day we'll all stand before God to give an account of what we've done with this responsibility and my prayer for all of these parents standing here today would be that they would hear the words, well done. We thank you for the extended family members that are here in the audience today who stand with them. And for the entire church family that now has this privilege of partnership with these and all families to know, love, and serve each other. We pray your blessing over these parents today and thank you for your sufficient grace for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. For the Gilberts, why don't you come center stage here for the dedication? For Carolyn Kate. Good morning, Caroline. We doing good today? We doing good? There we go. Will I be able to hold you? Isn't she beautiful? Your big sister's watching me like, what are you doing with my little sister here today? But Michael and I now dedicate you to God and to God's holy purposes for your life. May the environment of your home, the influence of this church, and the very presence of God's spirit birth within you a desire to grow and become a woman after God's own heart. May God bless you, keep you, and make his face shine on you. Amen. And to celebrate this moment in uh, Carolyn's life, we have a certificate of dedication a letter for her to open on her 13th birthday, and a very special gift Bible uh, for her. Congratulations to them. Thank you. Bush Holmes, why don't you step up here? We'll start with Paxton. Paxton, are we, we, we good here? Paxton, right? Oh, fast asleep. Are we good? We 
we have uh, two sets of twins uh, for dedication, one earlier today and, and you today. So, Paxton Ray, I now dedicate you to God and to God's holy purposes for your life. May the environment of your home, the influence of this church, and the very presence of God's spirit birth within you to grow and become a woman after God's own heart. May God bless you, keep you, and make his face shine on you. Amen. And we have a certificate for Paxton, a letter for her to open on her 13th birthday, and a very special gift Bible as well. Congratulations. Tegan. Tegan, I now dedicate you to God and to God's holy purposes for your life. May the environment of your home, the influence of this church, and the very presence of God's Spirit birth within you a desire to grow and uh, become a person after God's own heart. May God bless you, keep you, and make his face shine on you. God bless you. And we have a certificate, again, to remember this dedication services, a service, a letter to open on your 13th birthday, and a very special gift Bible as well. Thank you. God bless you, parents. And Barrett Scott. Barrett, you still sleeping? He is awake. And this is a young, about a month old, right? About a month old, just over a month. Wow, getting a little restless here. Hang in there, buddy. We're soon done. <laughs> Barrett, I now dedicate you to God and to God's holy purposes for your life. May the environment of your home, the influence of this church, and the very presence of God's spirit birth within you a desire to grow, become a man after God's own heart. May God bless you, keep you, make his face shine on you. Amen. And we have a certificate uh, for Barrett, a letter for him to open on his 13th birthday, and a very special gift Bible as well. Church, would you join me in just thanking these families for their commitment today? You may be seated. Church, will you stand with us as we continue to worship this morning and just fill this place with praise and our hallelujahs to our God who sits on the throne, who is so worthy of it all. Just lift our voices and our hearts to him this morning and sing this together.
we give you all the glory this morning. We thank you for being a God that is holy and pure. You are perfection. We just want to pour out our hearts as an offering to you this morning, God. That it would fill this place. That it would fill where you are seated on the throne that you would be pleased with what is offered this morning, God. We thank you for this time that we can just come and be in your presence to be filled and renewed and restored. God, I pray that your joy and your hope would just come and live in us this week as we go out to the world. Help us to be your light in the darkness. We love you so much. We thank you for all that you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church, you can be seated. Hey, good morning, church. Uh, so my name is Carter Eckenrode. Um, a little bit about myself. So I'm 15 and I'm in high school. I do soccer and I die for a school. Uh, my parents are Scott and Amy Eckenrode. You might see my dad. He's over here pulling the bass earlier. He's also a youth pastor here. Um, I serve in our youth group. I am. Uh, I play acoustic guitar for the worship team that we have there. And this is like what I want to do when I grow up. Like being able to speak in front of people, being a pastor. That's literally like my dream job. So I'm in my element right here and I just love pe preaching in front of people. So the scripture today is from Revelation 21, one through seven. Apparently I'm not allowed to preach so I can't say anything else about it. <laughs> Hear the word of the Lord. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw, I saw, the, holy, uh, I saw the holy city. New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from, from God, prepared as a bride adorned to her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and he will be with his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will, be, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write down, for these are the words, trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give spring of water of life without payment. And, those who, and the one who conquers will have heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Give it up for Carter this morning. <clears throat> Had me worried there, brother. I was going to have to take the mic, but anyway. Thank you so much, Carter. We're so glad that you were able to share and uh, are, are excited about your next steps as well. So thank you so much for, for joining us that being a part of our family. What's up, church? How's everybody doing? Yeah, it's great to be back up here with you. And this has been quite a weekend, right? Oh, my goodness. Uh, all together, 13, 14 children dedicated between all of our campuses 35 new members who are partnering now with Grand Point with us, and 11 that were baptized here on Saturday night, but uh, all together, about 14 between all of our campuses. God is good, isn't he? Amen? Let's give it up for God this morning. We're going to talk a little bit more about baptism in just a little bit, but for now, we need to have a talk, church, okay? Pretty serious thing about Christmas decorations and lights, Okay? Anybody decorate before Thanksgiving? Don't be shy. Put them up, okay? You guys are now the reason why there was snow last week. I'm just telling you. Well, it's, it's us too, because we had that as well. My wife uh, worked on me. She brought down this stubborn beast, and we put up some Christmas lights before Thanksgiving as well. Actually, earlier in the month, when it was really warm out. So that's us too. So we're in that. Um, it just makes sense. Anyway. Thanksgiving is over now, so you are officially allowed to decorate before Christmas, for Christmas, okay? We're seeing it here on stage, but you're also doing that at home. My question to you is, as you opened up those decorations and stuff like that, did you notice 
Any Christmas lights that were just not working? Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm not doing. So what do you do with that? Do you keep them? Or do you just kind of throw them out and start all over, right? My opinion was, hey, they don't work. We're done. Get them out. But my wife, bless her, <laughs> decided she wanted to try to fix the lights. Let's fix them. Been holding on to these forever. So it's, we can save some money. I don't know what she was thinking. But she decided to uh, research on YouTube how to fix Christmas lights. <laughs> so you check the wires, every little bit of the wire. You check each bulb. <laughs> you check the fuses. How many didn't know there were fuses in Christmas lights? Yeah, you check each one. Well, long story short, she came around, church. Let's give it up for Cressa. You just, just throw away the Christmas lights. No more fixing old Christmas lights. Who's with me? Amen. There it is. Okay. New lights this year. The trouble is, next year they're not new anymore. <laughs> so we have to restart the whole process. Are they going to work? I don't know. We'll see. Well, my point is this. I don't know if you get it or not, but Jesus isn't into just fixing up the old. Cheesy segue, I know. But I had to put it out there. Jesus is into making all things new. All things new. He's not discarding the old. He's totally remaking it. He is restoring it to brand new. That's what we've been studying through the book of Revelation in the last couple months. Through this whole series, all things new. We are getting a glimpse of how Jesus is doing it. How is he bringing this newness and restoration on the earth? We've been studying all about that. We're in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, the final chapters of our Holy Scripture. And I believe the message is pretty simple. It's pretty clear. We know God is holy, and he is separate and distinct from, from his creation because he can't be around evil and sinfulness because he's holy. It's part of his nature. He just can't be around it. But by Revelation 21, guess what, God? All evil, all sin, and all of God's enemies are gone. We studied about this a little bit last week. The final judgment, the white throne, the final judgment's been cast. And the enemies of God and those who wanted nothing to do with Jesus in this life are given what they want in eternity. It's a choice. So without the presence of evil and sin, God comes back to dwell among us here in this place. Verse 3 uh, de uh, details this. Here's what he says. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, or listen up, give your full attention. The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Listen to this, verse 4, pretty powerful passage. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain. For the former things have passed away. Amen. And verse 5, and he who was seated on the throne, we know who that is. It's Jesus, the Lamb of God. He said this, behold, I'm making all things new. All things new. What do you think of when you hear that phrase? We've heard it a lot in this series. What the, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? For me, I don't know why, but I think about muscle cars. <laughs> okay. I think of the 69 Camaro or the 69 Chevelle, 69 Mustang. It was a great year for cars, muscle cars. Someone reminded me, don't forget the GTO. Am I right? So we, we have the muscle cars. The first thing that came to my mind, it's completely restored and maybe even upgraded with the latest technology. I don't know if you can do that or not, but man, can you imagine that? It's old, but it's new. Or I also think of maybe a butterfly. Anybody think about butterflies when you think about all things new? It, a worm goes in the cocoon and a butterfly totally comes out 
It's totally transformed. It's not what it used to be. It's something brand new. I also imagine these old bodies of ours with all our creaks and sores and all that stuff. No more disease. No more cancer or COVID. No more birth defects. No more painful joints or muscles. We can run all we want. Anybody do the turkey trot on Thanksgiving morning? Anybody? We had a couple people there. There, okay. Yeah, we're still feeling it from this. This was our first one. No more sore muscles. No more sore joints. Amen. I also think about this, church. I think about baptism. Baptism is such a powerful symbol for us that our old lives are being buried with Christ. And we are raised to new life, coming up out of that water with Jesus in his resurrection. So I just want to say thank you to all of those who went public through baptism with Christ this weekend. You all are a living example for us of how Jesus is restoring all things. I don't know what you think about. However you imagine it, we're going to be made new. We're going to have new bodies glorified bodies. I don't don't quite get my head around what that's going to be like, but our world will also be made new and restored. Think about this, church. Without the opposition of sin and evil, God's love, his truth, God's holiness, and God's very presence will will be free to permeate the whole earth. In fact, That's exactly what John is trying to describe for us. Verse 10, he says, the God's city, the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ will come out of heaven from God. It's his work, it's his creation of making all things new, and it's gonna come here. So like uh, Augustine in his work, The City of God, if any of you are into Augustine, I mean, some light, there you go, Some, some light reading for you. Just kidding, that's totally sarcastic. The city of God. In that illustration, he gives an illustration of where he was standing along the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Has anyone been to the Mediterranean? Had a couple in the free. There you go, okay. Beautiful, beautiful place. Augustine is there, and he gives this, this quote. He says, if these are the beauties afforded to sinful men, what does God have in store for those who love him? Isn't that an amazing question to think about and ponder? What this means, I believe, is that imagine the best place that you have ever been to. I don't know where you've been. Maybe you've been to the Grand Canyon. You see that at sunrise, and it's all beautiful. Maybe you've been to the ocean, and that is this, just a place of beauty for you. Maybe there's the sky illuminating with an explosion of color. I don't know what that place is for you, but whatever that was just pure beauty for you, Okay? Whatever you've experienced, God's city will be mind-blowingly so much more beautiful for those who love God. It's incredible. It's hard to describe, but John takes a stab at it. Here's what he says in chapter 21. This city, the bride of Christ, will will be built from the finest of jewels and stones. This is interesting. Verse 11 tells us it would be like our famous jewels and stones. It, that's the best description that he has. Will there be actual jewels and stones? We don't know, but they're gonna look like it. That's the best comparison John had for us. Pretty amazing. Uh, John also describes the streets of gold and the pearly gates, uh, gates to this city made from one single pearl. That's a huge pearl. I don't know what, where you find something like that, but that's huge. It's a sight that we can hardly even get our minds around. But John doesn't stop there. He actually tries to describe what will not be there as well. This is interesting. Verse 1, he says, there will be no sea. The sea in ancient times was a symbol for chaos and mystery and darkness. Well, John is telling us there won't be any of that there. He's not saying that there won't be water. He's just saying there won't be a sea. There won't be chaos. There won't be darkness. There won't be any reason to fear this mystery there. Uh, Verse four, he says there won't be any tears. There won't be any death. There won't be any mourning. There won't be crying. There won't be any praying. All of the stuff 
that is so fundamentally part of our human existence here, it won't be there. Suffering, death, pain, it's gone. I like this description in verse 22 as well. John tells us there will not be any temple. You won't have to go to a place or building to worship God. The whole city will be the temple. And in fact, when John starts spouting off all these dimensions in chapter 21, to the Jewish readers, they would have thought about the holy of holies. What's John saying? (laughs) Well, the holy holy of holies, the hot spot of God's presence will be all over the city and in fact, all over the world. That's amazing, isn't it? There will be no sun or moon, verse 23. Tells us why. Because God's glory will be our light. I would imagine the sun and moon don't go away. They just, we won't be able to see them because God's glory will be brighter than them. And then I love this description, verse 25. He tells us there will be no closed gates. Those pearly gates that we we take notice, they'll be wide open. There won't be any need to close them. There won't be any evil. There won't be any people to keep out. There won't be any need for darkness and and shutting things down. No, it's wide open. It's beautiful. It's an amazing picture. And then he expands on it in chapter 22. John wants to share the meaning of this description, this description of the new Jerusalem. What's that going to look like? He's showing us through this vision in chapter 22 that the Garden of Eden, back Genesis 2, before the fall of man, the Garden of Eden will be restored inside this city. There's going to be a river of life there. There's going to be a tree of life there. And listen to this. God himself will be there, just like in Genesis chapter 2. God will walk with us, and it tells us we will even see his face. The implications of this in verse 4 is that we will see his face and not die. Because that's what Scripture tells us in other pieces uh, of Scripture, that when you see the face of God, you won't be able to live. That's not the case here. You will see him face to face. And then I love what verse 5 has to tell us as well. And they, who, who is they? That's us. Those who are following Christ. And they will reign forever and ever. That's amazing. Don't miss this, church. If you remember Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall, they were in charge. They had dominion over the earth. They were naming all of the animals and the plants. They were bringing health and beauty and God's glory to all of God's creation. God gave them his authority also when he created them in his image. So what happened? Satan happened. Satan happened. A fallen angel. Yes, angels have free will, but they do not have the authority that we have. They are not created in the image of God like we are. So here's what what, what happened back in Genesis. Since Satan could not ascend to the Most High and become God... He took the next best thing. He robbed us. He robbed humanity of our place in the created order by tempting Adam and Eve to sin. And you know the rest of the story, how it all ever went since then. And I believe that as humans, (laughs) we've been grabbing for power ever since then, trying to gain what we lost in the garden, the authority that we have directly from God. So what did Jesus do? Jesus lowered himself to our level. You see the power in that? He became one of us in order to restore what we lost and we could never get back on our own. Christ's death and his resurrection gave us our place back, spiritually speaking. But when Eden is restored, listen to this church, our rightful place in the created order will be given back physically Two, what's this mean? In Christ, we reign now spiritually, but then we will reign physically on this new earth as kings 
with our King of Kings, Jesus. That's us. Isn't this a revelation like no other? Isn't this a glorious account that John's trying to describe for us? We dream about this stuff. And so throughout this series, we've been asking the question, what is the revelation of Jesus, which is what the name of this book is, what's the revelation of Jesus in these chapters that we have to examine? So far in this series, we've seen that Jesus is the Son of Man. He's the Lord of the church. And he's got a message for us if we have ears to hear. We find out that Jesus is the lion and the lamb at the same time. I don't know how that is, but he is. We find out that Jesus is the harvester and the groom, and he is. Last week, we saw that he is the warrior king and the judge. In chapters 21 and 22, what do we see? We see that Jesus is our restorer. He's our restorer. When Jesus returns, the curse will be gone. Verse 3 of chapter 22. But for right now, the curse is broken. It's just not gone entirely. We are in what, in what theologians call the already but not yet. The already but not yet. Paul describes it like this. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. What's going on here is we exist in the overlap of the ages. We exist between when Christ began the work of restoration, the already, and when his work will be completed when he returns to restore all things, the not yet. We're right in the middle. We're right in the middle of this phase and here's the cool thing about the already but not yet. We don't have to wait until Christ returns to get in on his restoration of all things. Amen? Notice Jesus' words. I am making all things new. Not I will. It begins now, church. It begins when we receive Christ and make him the leader of our lives. Jesus' restoration it's a present reality with a future completion. We believe, as Philippians 1.6 says, that he who began a good work in you, who's that? That's Jesus. He will carry it out to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. But how? What's that restoration look like? How do we get the restoration started? I don't know if you're asking that question or not. Revelation 22:14 14 gives us the answer. He says, blessed are those who wash their robes that they might have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. And you might be thinking, that's all it takes? We just got to wash up and clean up our robes? Not exactly that easy, okay? We try our best, don't we, to clean up our lives and get things in order? But you know as well as I, it doesn't work. There's challenges to that. Even on our best days, we mess it up all the time. So what's the only detergent church that will get out the stain of sin on ourselves, on our lives? You know this. It's only the blood of Jesus. He washes us up and he renews us by his blood through his Holy Spirit. I love the key passage for our regeneration recovery ministry. It's Titus 3. Verses three to seven, I wanna read that for you. Here's what it says. For we ourselves were once foolish and disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures. What did we do? We were passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Doesn't this sound like the world we live in right now? Perfect description. But listen to this, verse four. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, what did he do, church? He saved us. Not because of works done but by our righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly, richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become what? We might become 
heirs according to the hope of eternal life. What do you see here? It's Jesus. He's the one that brings the washing. He's the one that brings the renewal. Jesus is our restorer. That's our passage. That's what we learn from this. What we stayed at uh, regeneration, we stayed it like this. Jesus didn't come to make your life better. He came to make you new. He came to make you brand new. A new heart, a new life, a new attitude, new relationships, new marriages, all things new. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5 says this. If anyone's in Christ, they are what? They're a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. The new church, it starts now when we receive Christ and make him our leader. And he will continue that work every day in us. 2 Corinthians 4 tells us we don't lose heart. No, though our outer self is wasting away. Anybody feel like that lately? Our inner self, what's on the inside, is being renewed day by day. It's only the work of Jesus. It's only the work of the Holy Spirit in us that regeneration and renewal comes. So what's the point of all this? What's the point? We need to wrestle with this reality, church. Here it is. The way to get on on Jesus' restoration of all things when he returns is to be experiencing it now while we're still alive in this life. Another way to say it? You can know you'll be included in Jesus' restoration of all things then if he's restoring your life now, right now. You can know, you can have that assurance that it's going to happen. It's going to be completed. I just need to trust him for the day by day. So almost a year ago, I learned that I would be stepping into the recovery director role I've worked with this ministry before through other people to lead that ministry. Uh, It's been amazing. But I learned about a year ago, I'd be stepping into the day-by-day facilitating of that role. No problem. (laughs) I was familiar with it. I just step in. I was going to build the team. I was going to equip the leaders. I was going to hand it off. Everything would be great, right? Wrong. (laughs) You know how it goes. God wanted to restore something in me, church. And I got to tell you, as we transition into this regeneration model, God took me deeper than ever, showing me how to truly deal with the struggles that I have, the depression, the impurity, the anxiety. Church, I struggle with confidence. I struggle with codependency. I just struggle with the fear of man and failure and insecurity and perfectionism. Yeah, I'm I'm a mess. (laughs) It's a lot of issues, but I had to face all of it and learn how to turn away from my sin, my struggles, and turn toward God to relearn how to be real with other people, how to let other people into my life. I had to relearn how to depend on God every day. Jesus is restoring me. I have new life in Christ. At 47 years old yesterday, (laughs) crazy times, almost 30 years into following Jesus, he's still working on me. He's still restoring my life. And I'm urging you to come along with me. Join me in this. We're realizing this at Regen. Regen is for everyone. I had several people come and say, I wish everybody could get on this. Yes, it's that important for you to taste what Jesus wants to do in you to restore your life. So consider this your invitation. February 2nd, 6.30, in the Youth Center, Regeneration kicks off with a new semester. We'd love to have you experience that. But here's the thing. You don't have to wait till then. Jesus' restoration can begin now, today. I'm inviting you to taste that, church. Because here's what I believe. When we truly experience Jesus, the restorer, we're going to want to invite as many people as possible to get in on it. 
verse 17 of chapter 22 ends it like that. It says, the Spirit, which is God, third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God in his fullness, and the church, I hear you kids, I'm working on it, okay? <laughs> the bride, we say what? Come. Are you thirsty? Evidently, there's a lot of thirsty people. Out there. Come. We've got water of life. It's free. It's what you're really, really craving. So here's my invitation to you. I'm inviting you to consider, what is it that needs restoring in you? What needs to be made new? Maybe even, in fact, what's killing you right now? What's your struggle or your sin? What do you need to surrender to Jesus to restore today? If you've never tasted what Jesus can do for you, the spirit and the bride, we say, come, join us. Get a taste of it. What I love about our scriptures, yeah, it's true. It doesn't end in destruction like our world and like Hollywood want us to believe. The asteroids and the earthquakes and the tidal waves, they want you to believe that our world is going to end in destruction. The Bible tells us something different. The Bible doesn't end in destruction. It ends with renewal. And it ends with an invitation. An invitation, number one, to experience all that Christ wants to do and restore in you. The restoration of all things. Come, join us with that. But it also ends with an invitation to Jesus himself. To come back. Verse 20. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Is that your prayer? Or maybe you're saying, wait, Lord Jesus. I don't know where you're at in all of this. But th those of us who are following Christ, we want him to come back as quickly as possible. Not so that we get rescued from this dark and dismal world, although that looks really good on some days, trust me. But the biggest reason is that once we get a glimpse of Jesus' restoration of all things, it fills us with hope. It doesn't have to end this way. No matter how dark our world gets, Jesus is making all things new. So what do we say? Bring it on, Jesus. We're ready for you. Come, Lord Jesus. Will you pray with me? God, that's a glorious vision. One that's really hard for our minds to get around. When everything will be made new. When everything in our world seems to be headed toward destruction, it's your word that points us to the restoration of all things in a world that can leave us utterly hopeless. It's your word that leaves us with eternal hope for those of us here today that need a new life not just the better one Jesus draw us to you the restorer of all things help us to surrender to you today together we pray come Lord Jesus restore our world restore us today forgive us of all of our sin we belong to you. Help us to walk in the new life that you're giving to us, even today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people say, Amen. Church, will you stand with us one more time?
hard to comprehend from the book of Revelation. Our prayer is that you saw hope rising. We hope in Christ's second coming when he will restore all things. But this week, we also want to launch into our remembrance of Jesus' first arrival, the advent of Christmas. Today, we light the first candle of Advent, the candle that represents hope. What is hope? Scripture tells us that hope is the belief that God will keep his promises. Hope is having faith that even when we can't see it, God is working all things together for good. Hope will give us the strength to endure, the confidence to Thank you so much for coming in today. For all of you who are guests uh, with our families, thank you for coming. Let me just give you a little glimpse of what's happening the rest of this uh, Advent season. Uh, as Doug said so clearly today, this book of Revelation ends with an invitation. And that invitation is going to continue ne all, all the way through uh, Christmas Eve. Actually, it never stops. But for our series, uh, our December series is called Come Lord Jesus. Next week, we're going to say, come, Lord Jesus, replace our fears with your faith. 
The following week is come, Lord Jesus, replace our shame with your grace. And then the third week into this series is come, Lord Jesus, replace our guilt with your forgiveness. And that brings us to Christmas Eve where we light the Christ candle. And it's going to be come, Lord Jesus, replace the darkness with your light uh, in our lives, in our community, and in our world. So we invite you to come. It's going to be a great series as we work this invitation out in some very, very practical ways. There was a lot in our services this weekend. We realized that. Uh, we went long. Thank you for your patience with that. Doug. Thank you for preaching this morning and kind of wrapping this up today with this great message on hope. Well, let me pray for us. So let, oh, before we do that, let me remind you that Christmas is a season of giving, right? So out in the lobby, we have our giving tree. Uh, it's the giving tree that's covered with all these snowflakes. And every one of those snowflakes has a specific need on them. Uh, that represents one of our community partners. So if you want to just be a blessing to one of our community partners, uh, take one of those snowflakes, do a little shopping, bring that gift back, and uh, you will be a blessing. Uh, you are. You are a blessing to this church. Thank you so much for your generosity and uh, for your presence here today. Lord, now as we leave this room, we're going out into the big room, out into the big room of our world, into the, our communities, uh, with our families, back into the workplace tomorrow. And uh, we want to take the hallelujah that has kind of been risen up within us today, and we're going to take that out and share it with the world around us, uh, because Christ has come, is coming, and uh, will come again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, church.